Right, so I'm going to give you just a brief outline of some of the work that we do in UCD. And the work that uh, I'm going to talk about really hasn't been done so much in UCD, but we do do work similar to this. But what I'll do is I'll concentrate on the work which led to the Nobel Prize being awarded uh, this year. And it gives you a flavour for what work is being done in the area of imaging and what you can do with light uh, to see things and objects. And as maybe the Nobel Prize being awarded for this indicates maybe why it's important that uh, such work is, is to be done. So really what we're concerned with this, just for this particular talk is looking at how we can see materials and how we can see them using light. And the work that was done in this, as I mentioned, led to the Nobel Prize being awarded because what these three gents did with others was showing that you can use light to look at ultra small objects, smaller than you would normally expect to be able to see. So it's what they refer to as nanoscale as the previous talk, talk or outlined. In other words, what we refer to is small in that regard. And when you look at an object with light, typically you would use a microscope. And as the name indicates or implies or uses, you're looking at what they call the micro length scale. So you have kilometers, you have millimeters, and if you go smaller, you have micrometers. And that normally was the limit for optical microscopy. But if you go smaller than that, it's called nanometers. And as I've shown here, it's the nanoscope that sometimes people refer to this technology as. And this leap in technology from the microscope to the nanoscope essentially was the uh, topic of the research which led to that, this award. And what we can see here is a few different things. It's the photograph of the two people and across the top really looks to sort of ask the question, what can we see when two objects are far away from one another? We can clearly see that they are two. But when they're brought close together, sometimes it's hard to know whether there's one or two. This is because there's a limit in what we can see. It's a limit in our optical resolution or our ability to see is challenged. And that's true for a microscopy as it is for the everyday world. And when we talk about microscopy and its limits of what we can see in terms of size, no matter how well you make your microscope up until recently, you could never see smaller than approximately this length scale here. In other words, what we have here is a limit. In this area, we cannot see the feature sizes but maybe in this area we can. So with an optical microscope, you can see the feature sizes of a human hair, you can see the features of an ant. So if you have one or two ants, you can see those. But if you have one or two viruses or molecules, you cannot see those. And what this led to, towards was that there was a, an ability to make a microscope, as this image shows, and a microscope can give you features. For example, you can see objects, but we also recognize that there's a limit in what we can see. And so this sort of movie there emphasizes that you can see detail, but the blurriness indicates that there's a limit to that detail. What the researchers showed was that up until recently was that the availability of new technology this new technology came about in the 1990s, and this new technology centered on what we refer to as a laser, which is a light source, a very high-powered light source that you can control the properties of that light with, in other words, its directionality, that you couldn't previously use. And in addition to that, there was a leap forward in what we refer to as detection or camera technology, how sensitive you can see light. And what this enabled people to do was ultimately now begin to see single molecules. And this was seen as an important step forward. Because what we're doing here is that we're seeing individual molecules. However, what we also see is those molecules tend not to continually emit light, but tend to go bright and dark what they refer to as switching on and off 
or blinking. And this was an unexpected phenomena, which is really where, when we go to ultra-small levels, we no longer view the world in the classical way, which sometimes people refer to as Newtonian mechanics. We're looking at what we refer to as the quantum world. So why does it go on and off and behave in this particular manner where you expect it just to be on all the time? And this is because it's a, a different physical phenomena governing it that we don't really see in the real world. But nevertheless, leaving those sort of odd behavior asides at the very small level, what we do for sure know is that they go on and off and they blink in this random way. And this actually is known to be random. You can statistically prove, in fact, that this is truly a random event. So what this enabled now people to do was to say that we can see single molecules. How can this be then applied to enable us to see better and to see small feature sizes? Well, what they did was they put molecules inserted inside, for example, the object they wish to test. And we'll just say, for example, concentrate on biological applications, how we can see the biological features in more detail than we could previously. We put our molecules inside this biological entity, and there's different ways in which they can do that in biology. You can actually get genetics to express these dyes. It's called genetic modification, so they naturally will occur. Or you can simply insert the dyes in a sort of sophisticated manner using biochemistry. But ultimately, you can insert the dyes or refer to as labels inside your biological uh, material, your biological tissue. And what you can now note is that if you were to use this technology of this ability to label, when we have our two objects far away, they blink on and off. When they're close together, like our people were before, and where now you might begin to challenge whether you have two objects or whether you have one, because one blinks and switches off, you now know that there's one, and when it blinks and comes back on again, and maybe the other one switches off, you can then identify the position of the second. So this switching on and off means that when they come closer together, because they disappear and reappear, it gives you an opportunity to see. So previously, when they were overlapping like this, you weren't sure whether you had one or two, but because one disappears, you know this is one in this position here, and very close, there's a second one, rather than just being one. So this ability then to, this blinking ability, we can now use to get a little bit more detail than we could previously, effectively. And the technology behind utilizing that in the 2000s led to this. And this, as the yellow indicates, it's this position. Now, it takes a lot of computing power and a lot of time and effort. But what they did was they positioned each of those molecules which are blinking on and off, and those which are very, very close together, they paid close attention to, and they got the precise position of those blinking objects. And they created a map. But what we note now is that map has a little bit more detail than the previous map, which was blurred. And what they did was, they constructed all those blinking beacons on and off and merged them into this map previously. And this was ultimately the secret behind getting that extra resolution, more so than there were before, when they would use loads and loads of labels and disregard the blinking effect, and just looked at all, all that was bright and only of those which were on. And what I found was this particular example here which shows how you can now apply with extreme effort and it so let's just get this back onto the screen. So if you were to have an ultra powerful computer and time and effort, what you can do is create structural information as shown here. And this is an example of research now going on to understand the brain. And because the brain is a mass of very, very small tissues, neurons, constructed in ultra-complex uh, manner, it's always been a challenge, and still is today a challenge to understand. And it's one of the challenges facing medical science is things like Alzheimer's and all those diseases associated with the mind. And it's Information that 
this super resolution methods can provide that can perhaps unlock some of the opportunities and maybe make some advances towards understanding better issues in medical research, for example, along the lines of understanding better the brain. And it's because of this significant impact that the Nobel Prize was ultimately awarded for. And some of the examples are shown here in colour of where advances using this technology has been made. Now, it's not to say that Huntington's disease has been cured, but we understand more than we did because of this technology. And so looking at the brain is, is considered to be a very significant um, area in medicine presently. So it's diseases associated with that, and of course other diseases as well. Understanding fundamental behaviour in biology, how cells grow. And all those sorts of examples all can benefit and have benefited uh, from this technology. So I would just like to leave you with that um, as my talk, which is hopefully maybe you might understand what we refer to today as nanoscopy, and maybe you might appreciate why it's important, and maybe even how we can go about uh, making uh, a nanoscope using light to see objects better. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>